Okay, so, so we spoke about the, uh, the myth and its emergence in, in rabbinic literature. So now let's go back to reality and what happens in, Eret- in Israel and in the diaspora at that time. So Jews, after the Roman conquest and after the destruction of the temple, Jews start spreading all over the Roman Empire. Even before that, there were already uh, you know, uh, major Jewish um, communities, one in Babylonia that dates all the way back to the uh, destruction of the first temple in, the, in 586 before the Common Era. There's also a, uh, a community in, in uh, uh, Elephantine or Yev in Egypt that, that is a, a Hellenistic Egypt that is a Greek-speaking. But some of them not, didn't speak Hebrew. Very f- a famous author at the time was Philo of uh, Alexandria or Yedidia in Hebrew. Um, and they have access to the lit, to, the, to Greek literature, um, and now there's a new uh, there's a new uh, wave of migration towards the Roman colonies. So there are Jews in North Africa, there are Jews in Spain, Jews in North Africa. Just as a side comment, according to some scholars, were there already from the eighth century before the Common Era. They um, they arrived with the Phoenicians with seafarers, uh, but in in general, Jews are spread now all over the. The, we would say the known world. They're in Greece, in Rome, Spain, uh, Roman colonies, even in some parts of, of later in, uh, later on, they will be in Britain and France, and they're in North Africa, Babylonia, Israel, and Egypt. Um, and there's always a very close connection between the scholars of different cultures. Um, just as in the time of the Bible, the uh, Jewish worship was uh, was influenced. I mean, not Jewish, the Israelite, whatever we call the Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a very strong influence of uh, outside cultures. So also in the um, um, when when they moved away from paganism, and they are they encounter philosophers or different religions like Zoroastrianism in uh, in Persia. And the Greek philosophers and and uh, and other uh, and, and Christianity, there's always a close connection between uh, between scholars, because we have to realize that uh, people, um, how would I say that, uh, when you live, you know, people tend to think maybe because we don't see it today in a, in a very common way that you know uh, at least orthodox orthodox scholars orthodox rabbis. Do not inter to interact too much with the uh, with Muslim or Christian uh, scholars, right? But back then, if you lived wherever you lived, you lived in a in a in a small community, and there were only a few scholars in town. So you don't care if the scholar is Christian or Muslim or or a Greek philosopher. This for you is the uh, the kind of social circle that 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 you connect to. So. The early fathers of the church were very close with the rabbis of the of the Talmud. The uh, or, uh, origin was a uh, was a uh, a friend or you know acquaintance of Rabbi Avu of Caesarea, and later on in medieval times, uh, the different schools the different schools in the in the monasteries in uh, in France, uh, Victor of Saint Saint Hugo and other were were. Uh, you know, exchanging communication with uh, with Rashi and Ramban and others, so it always happens. Well, we always have to look into what what is happening in the cultures around uh, around the Jewish literature and action to understand what is what is going uh, what is going on within the literature. So, after the destruction, this the the, the Jewish world becomes more uh, dispersed and diverse. <clears throat> there is a uh, the the center of activity moves to Babylonia because the uh, the government there was more friendly. the uh, the Persian uh, the Persian Empire was more friendly towards Jews, whereas the Christian uh, the the Romans and then the and the Christian when uh, Rome became uh, officially a Christian empire in the fifth century, uh, the uh, the office of the president has been canceled and Jews were oppressed in a way. So it was more comfortable to learn and live in Babylonia. There was a prosperous diaspora to the uh, poor uh, Israeli existence. 
Um, and in Babylonia, we see the impact of the uh, Indo-Aryan uh, theology that later on will become, uh, you know, will move, we will be sort of reemerge in Germany. It's just, it's, there are many parallels between Indo-Aryan theology and German, uh, and German uh, Teutonic paganism. And you will find in the Talmud a lot of stories about demons and witches and, uh, and spells. Uh, and, you know, this is not mysticism. This is more, you know, like the, the dark arts. Um, but they will talk about uh, if you want to see demons, you have to take the ashes of a, of a black cat, um, which is the seventh uh, in the line of all uh, firstborns, etc., stuff like that. Um, and from the same period in in uh, in Babylonia, we find um, bowls and utensils with uh, with uh, with incantations and spells and so on. So we know that this is something that has affected the uh, um, the literature. The in uh, in around the uh, the sixth century, there's another uh, uh, cataclysmic event that is the rise of Islam. The uh, the Arabs who lived in the uh, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula came out of came out of there and within a hundred years took over the whole uh, almost the whole world with the exception of uh, of Rome the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire but it was a very swift very very fast uh, conquest that was unbelievable and of course it impacted everybody who stood in its path. The uh, the impact on the Jews who lived in the Arabian Peninsula originally was devastating because up to that period, up to the time, uh, Jews were about fifty percent of all the the dwellers of what today is Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and Yemen. Um, some through some were originally Jews, others converted. Muhammad tried to appeal to the to the Jewish tribes. It didn't didn't work that well. But uh, after those first hundred years that were uh, the company with bloodshed and wars, the uh, the, new, the Muslim rulers wherever they went uh, tried to work with the population. They 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 had the, the the wisdom of the desert dwellers, and they realized that it's not they don't know everything. They have their skills, and the best thing for them would be to combine them with the skills of the local population. And usually, their allies were the Jews, because the Christians were sort of a competing religion. Where the Jews did not have a state of their own, and they were, uh, they felt more more comfortable working with them. Also, the theology is much similar between Jews and Muslims than it is between uh, Judaism and Christianity. And part of the reason is that Muhammad originally tailored his uh, religion for the Jews of the Arabian Peninsula. He thought that they would join his his ranks. <clears throat> and therefore his practical mitzvot were prayers three times a day towards Jerusalem and one fast day a year, and the the day of rest would be the Shabbat. Once they rejected him, he replaced the three prayers with five, changed the direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca. Instead of one fast day, he created the month of Ramadan, where people fast for 40 days. And... Uh, moved the the rest day from Shabbat to Friday, but still, uh, it was much more comfortable for a Jew to live in a Muslim neighborhood in a Muslim environment than it was in a Christian environment. And that is that is where we could say that the split begins between Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews, um, and also between their schools of thought. The um, and the overwhelming majority of Jews today, I think, when they think of uh, of Judaism and its core beliefs or practices, uh, even when it just you know um, elements that for them are associated with Judaism, usually they they think with terms that uh, belong to the Ashkenazi world, right? If you think of what are, what are typical uh, typical Jewish foods, for example, should be gefilte fish or lox and bagel or or chopped liver. Uh, um, you know, uh, I heard more than once when when I speak with people, uh, and I, uh, where are you from? From Baghdad. So, oh, I didn't know there were Jews in Iraq. I didn't know there were Jews in India. 
I didn't know there were Jews in 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 uh, in Syria, for example. So that that is a product of modern times and the way we we perceive the world and its geography. But in in when we go back to ancient times, we realize that uh, Judaism was really a product of the Middle East. Judaism is a pure Mediterranean religion, and so are Christianity and Islam, uh, and Zoroastrianism. Uh, the the Middle East was a hotbed of cultures and religions, and as a matter of fact, it was the cradle of civilization. The Fertile Crescent is where human civilization started, where um, uh, hunters, gatherers became farmers. Uh, there's an interesting discussion of that in uh, um, you know the books by Jared Diamond, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and uh, and um, the collapse of civilizations. Uh, but in any case. The, uh, it's the, the importance of that knowledge is that there is a divergence, there's a point, certain point where the paths of, uh, of Jews under Islam and Jews under Christianity take, uh, take different directions. The, uh, most significantly, the change was, was very important for Jews who lived in Spain and in Babylonia, and later on in Morocco as well. And that became an axis around which Jewish activity uh, revolves. Spain, Morocco, and Iraq. Um, in Spain, when the, uh, when the Muslim conquerors arrived, they found out that the uh, local population is isolated, the Christian population is isolated from the, uh, from the uh, nobility who was of German origin. So they drove them away and they appointed the Jews as custodians of the cities. So they became the administrators, they became the, uh, the, the officers, and as a result, they were more free to, to practice their religion, to study. Originally, um, they were subjugated to the yeshivot and to the, uh, uh, to the schools of Babylonia, but around the 9th century, they broke free, and they started developing their independent uh, take. The Jews of Morocco, of uh, uh, of cities like Fez, where the first university was established in the uh, in the ninth century, and Qalat Hamad and Kairouan in North Africa, in in what today is Mauritania or uh, or Tunisia, uh, also had some of sort of a of an intellectual freedom, and they were engaged in all sciences and knowledge, etc. And so were the Jews of Baghdad. This is. Uh, the Sephardic school of thought actually started in Baghdad under the Geonim, the, the heads of the uh, Babylonian Shivot, and was later on continued in Spain. That's why I, for example, would refer to myself as a Sephardic Jew, because the, there's a tradition that started in Babel and continued in Spain for almost a thousand years, and it has um, impacted this, the... the uh, the Jews of the Mediterranean, the Iberian Peninsula, and North Africa, and the, which I'm part of. Uh, and that tradition was the idea that we do not reject uh, the outside culture, but rather we embrace it. And we take from it whatever is good for us. So that means that we embrace sciences and philosophy and language and music and literature. All these things are welcomed with a certain degree of caution, because we don't want to be overwhelmed by the uh, uh, by that foreign culture, but we're not afraid of it. Uh, and the reason that the the, uh, the Goanim were allowed were able to do that is because of that uh, sense of the, that that Islam is not that different of Judaism. Their main the main tenets of Islam are not that different. Their their place their houses of worship are not idolatrous. <clears throat> and they do not believe in other gods. They believe in one God. They only add uh, Jesus and Muhammad as as prophets. And they believe that Muhammad is superior to the other prophets. But they do not question the uniqueness, the unity uh, of God. And also by the fact that most under most uh, Muslim uh, rulers, Jews had a more or less comfortable life. On the other hand, when when we move. Uh, our focus into Western Europe, where the Ashkenazi community started. This is around the ninth century. The Bishop of uh, Cologne in uh, in Germany invites Jewish families from Italy to move into his town because he wants to boost the economy. Because Jews had this uh, 
reputation of being merchants of uh, uh, they were they were uh, well versed in many languages and they were able to travel the world with more ease than Christians or Muslims because they didn't belong to any of the major religions so they move now they move to uh, uh, to Western Europe to northern France and Germany and they established new communities there now what happens when they come there they are uh, they, they undergo a cultural shock because they are Mediterranean Jews who lived in Italy for, for several centuries but still maintain their uh, Mediterranean look and language and all that and they move into a completely different culture uh, the Gothic Catholic uh, German environment where they are demonized as the killers of God and where the imagery on, on churches on steeples everywhere wherever they turn they, they see the crucifixion uh, they, they get familiar with uh, with the local with the theology, and they understand that they talk about the divine, uh, the Holy Trinity. So they they speak of not of one God for them; it's three gods, and uh, all these things. I mean, it's it's, it's deeper than that. But uh, when you when we put it together, it caused them to recoil within themselves, even when they were no official ghettos. Uh, they wanted to maintain as much distance as possible from this culture. They felt that they live in a bubble and they have to maintain those walls around them. And in a sense, this is something that we can still see in uh, the, even the modern Orthodox Jewish world and definitely in the ultra-Orthodox. It's the sense of walls of separation, that the only way that one can be immune to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the ailments of, of, uh, of society is to completely shut himself in in that protective environment. Um, and what that caused is that the uh, when you look at the beginning um, now, at, at the beginning of the mystical tradition in medieval times, you will find that it mostly comes from the Ashkenazi world and then moves into the Sephardic world. The, because the Sephardic world was more logical and analytical, and the, the Ashkenazi world was more mythical and uh, relying on beliefs in, uh, uh, in, in, in demons or you know, in, in, in higher powers that, uh, even though I mentioned that before, it was, for an extent, it, it, it was in Babylonia as well, but it was picked up in, um, uh, in Germany and in Provence. <clears throat> what we have from the Sephardic world of the time, we have Rav Saadia Gaon, who wrote his treatise of philosophy, and we have Maimonides, and they all tried to struggle with the with the concepts of um, of the theosophy of the Bible, which is anthropomorphic. God has hands and legs and heart. He regrets. He speaks. He cries. All these things that are in the Bible, the the Rav Saadia Gaon and uh, Maimonides later on tried to grapple with. Uh, and they present it with, in a very uh, clear philosophical way. The The problem was that, uh, just as we mentioned before, with the emergence of, of Midrash, that people wanted some, sorry, some juice, you know, they wanted something interesting, something engaging, a narrative. Uh, not everyone can read The Guide of the Perplexed. Uh, some people write it and become perplexed. It's 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 not an easy book to read. It's not uh, let's say it's not bedtime uh, reading, um, and and they wanted more more than that. Uh, they could associate it in a way to the uh, liturgy and the uh, and the uh, writings of Rav Sadia Gaon, and in in a very interesting way they took a philosophical concept that Rav Sadia Gaon created, which is that of Kavod Nivra. The, the glory that is the intermediary between us and God and turn it into a mystical, uh, a mythical uh, dimension that the, this kavod in itself is sort of an angel that you could communicate with and there's a manifestation of, of, uh, of a God's glory. So when we come to that period of the, um, of the, turn, of the, the turn of the millennium, what do we have in terms of the, the Jewish... Uh, Diaspora and the Jewish literature. Uh, yes, Sherry. Turn uh, your, little, yeah. Can you go back a tiny bit? Yes. And repeat what you just said about 
Saji Gaon having the intermediary and how yeah. that came about and what, what the effect was. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it more when we get to the beginning of, of mysticism in Provence. Uh, remember that I mentioned in the, one of the first class, in the first class, <laughs> that um, there was a, 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 a group called Hoga Kova Miyuhad, the, the circle of the, the designated cherub uh, or angel. And that is in the development of the ideology of the theology of Rav Sadegon, that there is sort of a designated angel or the glory of God uh, that, that uh, communicates with humans. So this is the first glimpse or, or indication that we're going into what is like later on the, the idea of sefirot, emanations. Because when you, if you're familiar with the sefirot of the Zohar, the idea is, is of like a flow, a, a, a spiritual flow, or maybe a better analogy would be uh, in, in, our, in our world, is that is of a power plant that you cannot plug, you're not going to plug your cell phone into the power plant, right, in order to recharge it. It has to go down through uh, several wires that, that uh, mitigate that, that energy until it gets to this world. So there's a flow that comes from the upper, higher sefirah, and down up until the level that we could communicate with. And there's a constant chain. The higher sefirah, which is Keter, and the lower one, which is Malchut, the crown and the kingdom, keep connecting. There's a lower, lower aspect of Malchut, which is the, the highest Keter of the, one, of the one below. And it keeps like, flowing down. So that is, in a way, the grain of the idea that Rav Sadegon presented, even though he did not, I don't think that most scholars believe, he did not mean it in a, mystic, in a mystical way, um, that there is some kind of intermediary between us and God. So uh, what, what Rav Sadegon meant was that there's a, maybe in the sense of a metaphor for us, to understand, there was a uh, uh, there was a concept that we, we we could relate to. I mean, Maimonides definitely speaks about metaphors. He says all the words that are uh, mentioned in the Torah that can or in the Bible that could uh, suggest that God has a physical shape or a body or that He behaves like a human being are all metaphors. They all meant lesaber et ozen to say that if we try to understand how we communicate with God and explain it in our terms, it would be God spoke or God saw or God thought. That's Maimonides. Rav Sadia Gaon says, no, there's, a, there's a, some kind of an entity that God creates for us to communicate with, and that entity does have dimensions. Uh, so... I don't know if it's something that could be uh, more a, a, a question of linguistics, because maybe Rav Sadegon just calls it the, crea- the, the designated glory, but he just gives a different term to the metaphor, because it, it still believes that it's abstract. So one could say, you know, this, this, uh, this metaphor of God's hands or heart or shape is that glory that it was created, meaning it's something that is created and conjured in our mind. But later on, as we'll see, the, 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 the early mystics of Provence, and later on in Spain, will expand that into the, uh, uh, what we could call the stratification in, uh, in, um, in Kabbalah, in, the, in theosophy, that there are different levels. Yeah. Okay. So, so going back to the uh, um, to the different worlds that we see between the Sephardic world and the Ashkenazi world, the Sephardic world there's a strong emphasis on sciences and and and, and logic, etc. And from that period, we have a question. It's around the turn of the uh, in the 11th century. Rav Haigaon is asked a question. You know how the uh, the communication worked. Uh, at the time between between the rest of the Jewish world and Babylonia, um, the communication worked in a way that when you had a question, you e- you mailed the email. I was emailed it. You mailed it to uh, to the Geonim of Babel. Yeah, it was as fast as email, just more like AOL. It took about six months together and and back. Um, so so one of the questions 
had to do had to do um, had to do with the uh, with the stories of a of uh, esoteric knowledge that that was brought to Italy by by someone from Baghdad, um, and that person was able to to perform quantum leaps. He was able to disappear from one place and reappear in another place. A term that is is uh, the midrash already mentions in, in the sense of kfitzat uh, derech, like a miracle, uh, you know, tra- traveling miraculously. Uh, the midrash says it about Eliezer, Eved Avraham. Uh, even though the Torah doesn't say that it was Eliezer, the Torah says that Eved Avraham traveled from Be'er Sheva and he came to Haran, and he made the uh, he knelt down the camels at night. So the commentary of the Midrash is, it was on the same day. He had this miracle that uh, he traveled this whole distance within a couple of hours. Um, but that not necessarily says that he disappeared from one place and reappeared in another place, just that it, it, it traveled very fast. Still, it's something that is beyond or you know against the laws of nature. But people believed at that time, at the 10th, 11th century, they believed that this is possible, that it is possible for people to perform quantum leaps and that it is possible for people to kill others by using uh, certain names. This is what uh, later on uh, is, uh, is titled Kabbalah Masit, Practical Kabbalah. Sort of the ability to manipulate the powers of nature by using Kabbalistic formulas. So Rav Hai Gaon, who is, like I said, is a rationalist, is a, he's a scientist, beside his knowledge of, of Talmud and Torah, says this is complete nonsense, this is impossible. Men do not have, uh, the uh, human beings do not have the power to control nature in that manner. Now one, again, when, when, when we look at our literature, you can say we have the... the, the um, the grain of the idea in rabbinic literature, because uh, the rabbis say, for example, that uh, that uh, Bilam was able to to was, knew the, the the time when God gets angry and he was able to curse uh, at that time and his curses would come true. So that that is a midrashic statement. It's not in the Torah, right? The Torah is just is is coming to cast a curse. Uh, but that midrashic statement is uh, uh, has major implications. What it says is that a human can manipulate God if he knows the right, he knows where to turn the key and push or pull the right levers. He could cause God to to destroy someone. Uh, so the rabbis answer that that uh, argument by saying, "Yes, God, God." gets angry at a certain point during the day, and if Bil'am was able to uh, to pinpoint that time and cast his curse, but for the sake of Israel, God did not get angry during the period that Bil'am was attempting to curse them. But that, that statement of the rabbis is, is basically saying, as much as you think that you can manipulate nature, God is always greater than you. And meaning that instead of rejecting the idea by saying this is complete nonsense, they said even if you think that you could uh, hack the system, the the chief programmer is greater than you and it will rehack you uh, by changing the password or something like that. So, but that was that was in, in, in rabbinic period. In, uh, in the time of the Gonim, on one hand, uh, um, Rav Gaon completely rejected Meanwhile, in the Ashkenazi world, we have the proliferation of uh, of mystical literature. That, that's where it starts. It starts in Provence and in France. And the first book that emerges and 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 becomes the uh, um, the foundation of that new school of thought. That's before the Zohar. The Zohar. We are not going to see the Zohar until the fourteenth fourteenth uh, century. Now we're talking about the 12th and 13th century. We have a a book called Sefer HaBahir. Uh, the the term Bahir means clear, and uh, it is taken from a, from a verse that speaks about the 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 shining bright light. 
then um, when this book appears, there's a there's a debate around it. There are those who swear by the book and say they that it contains uh, uh, amazing uh, secrets and esoteric knowledge, and not only that, it is attributed to a man by Rabbi Nehunya ben Akana. He's uh, from the Tanaitic period. He appears in the Mishnah. In uh, it doesn't appear much in Talmudic period. He is one. He's mentioned once, mentioned once in the Mishnah, in uh, Tractat Brachot, when they speak about prayers. I think it's in the fourth chapter. The other rabbis argue whether you have to say eighteen blessings every day or a short, an abridged version of the eighteen blessings. Uh, and Nehunya ben Akana says, just say. Uh, a short prayer, a short personal prayer every day, <clears throat> um, and he's also mentioned in a in a in a story about uh, someone who fell into a pit, and they came and they asked Nehunya ben Akana to pray for that person, and he said, uh, "Sorry, not not fell into a pit. Someone was was ill, and Nehunya would pray for him, and he, would, he was able to tell whether that person." Would live or die. So already in, in in rabbinical sources, he has this halo of a miracle worker. But that's that's mostly what we know of him. In the twelfth century, this book emerges, and it is attributed to Nehunya ben Akana. Now that is obviously a pseudo epigraph, meaning Nehunya ben Akana is not the author of the book. Uh, is not the author of the book because the book first of all because the book is written in Aramaic, and. Uh, uh, Nehunya ben Akana lived in Israel at the time where the, the the spoken language was Hebrew, and the and the uh, the written material was written in Hebrew. Which, by the way, same problem that we will encounter later on with the Book of the Zohar, because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who allegedly is the author of the Zohar, wrote his uh, most of his his, his uh, text in Hebrew. And if, when he used Aramaic in the uh, in some sections of of uh, Midrash Halacha, it's the eastern branch, sorry, uh, the western branch of Aramaic, which is the Eretz Israel Aramaic, and not the Babylonian Aramaic, which is more similar to the, the Aramaic the Zohar is written on, in and and this is something that I think that we mentioned before that one of the tools for us to be able to re, uh, uh, determine whether the literature, or what is the period of the literature, is the language. And the language of this book that I'm, we're talking about, Sefer Abahil, is Aramaic, and it's Babylonian Aramaic, not Israeli Aramaic. Besides that, the language is somewhat convoluted. Uh, so those who supported the book and, and, and saw, it as a source, saw it as a source of, of uh, uh, very deep, Divine esoteric knowledge. Uh, I thought that the, that the Aramaic is uh, an Aramaic of Eretz Israel, and that the book is attributed to Nehunya ben Akana, and as such, it has a high authority. Um, the the opponents had very uh, very very harsh words to say about that book. Um, one second. I want to read to you some of the reactions to the book at the time, and then we'll go uh, uh, deeper into the uh, into the schools of thought that existed at the time and how they uh, and how they developed a new this new theology. And of course, we're going to look uh, at text from the book. One second. About Sefer Abahir, we have uh, uh, we have writing about uh, Rabbi Tzhak ben Yaakov Akohen of Castilia. And um, and uh, his uh, his words are quoted by uh, Rabbi Shem Tov Ben Rabbi Shem Tov in the 14th century, and he says this. Veze gadol u meshubah etzel amekubalim amaskilim anekuvim ba mikra pilpul amikra va talmud habekiim beomek ayam gadol u sefer abahir hamiyusad bilishon ayirushalmi. He said, "This one, the, like, there are many books, and there are many, uh, many books are written in an esoteric language. But one of them, which is especially important, is uh, for those. Now, here's how he described the Kabbalists. It's important. 
He says they are maskilim, they are very knowledgeable or understand the deeper truths. Nekuvim b'mikra, pilpul mikra v'atalmud, they are very uh, well versed in the Bible, the commentary on the Bible and the Talmud. And this he writes, in my opinion, uh, because there was, uh, there was antagonism to the Kabbalists saying that they only dwell on the mysticism and they cannot handle the Talmud or the Bible itself. And he said, and what, what is this book is he talking about? He says, Sefer Abahir, this, the, the clear uh, book, Amiyusab Yerushalmi Yerushalmi, written in the language of the Yerushalmi Talmud, meaning the, the, Aramaic, the Aramaic of Eret Israel. And he says, Uyakar Mizahav Umipaz Rav, it is more precious than gold, Asher Gilabir Mazim Nistarim Venealamim Lemaskile Israel, and it was revealed through uh, hidden and concealed uh, secrets to the, uh, to the scholars of, of the nation by Rabbi Nehunya ben Akana. He's the one who makes this identification. He says, V'sefer ze ba me'eret Yisrael l'hasidei kadmonenu hachmei Ashkenaz ha-mekubalim. It came from Eret Yisrael and was given to the pious ancient people, the scholars of Ashkenaz of Germany, the Kabbalists. Uh, and here the Kabbalists is in the sense still of mekubalim, those who have the chain of transmission. And from there, it traveled to the uh, to the righteous people of Provence, Rabbanet Provincial. Those who know the uh, the knowledge of God. So those are high words of praise by a uh, Kabbalist, Yitzhak uh, ben Yaakov HaKohen, uh, from the 13th century, and he's quoted by someone in the 14th century, speaks very highly uh, of that book. Uh, on the other hand, we find uh, in the 13th century, in Provence, which is the same, that's the time where uh, the other rabbi attributed the revelation of the book to, and the time and place, and this is Rabbi Meir ben Shimon of Narvon. Narvon was one of the, uh, one of the, um, the main cities of the Jewish communities in Provence. It was mainly Narvon and Lunel. And Rabbi Meir ben Shimon of Narvon was, uh, uh, wrote an anti-Christian book. That's interesting because I remember that I said that there, there are parallels between the rise of Kabbalah and, and some Christian theologies. And, um, and here is the letter that he wrote against the, against the book and against the Kabbalists. He says, Yitpa'aru Bedivre kezavim lemor bene Torah vechokma matzanu. They they glorify themselves with lies, saying we have found wisdom and Torah. Halila halila meresha lindot ahare divre minut el lotiye kazot be Israel. He writes in rhymes. He says, um, God forbid we should not follow this wicked uh, path to wonder uh, following. Words of heresy. And I've heard that they they uh, put together a book that they called Habahir. It's the same book that the other one praised. And they, because of that book, they were not able to see light. So he's mocking the name that they gave the book. וכבר הגיע אותו הספר לידינו שחיבר להם ומצאנו בו שתלו אותו בריבי נחוניה בן הקנה חס ושלום and I have seen this book and I know that they attributed it to רבי נחוניה בן הקנה he says God forbid לא היה ולא נברא this is a fable ולא נכשל אותו ולא נכשל בו אותו צדיק and this righteous person would not have stumbled upon something like that or would it, would make such what, such an error? And he will not be counted among the wicked. I mean, this is a very this is a very harsh criticism. He says that the author of the book is a, is a, is a is a poshea is a is a sinner. He says ki lo yodea sefat sefer ve'imre shefer. He is not well versed. He's, he cannot write uh, correctly, and he cannot uh, uh, write eloquently. Ve'yesh bo divrei minut uchfira. 
mikol v'chol, arve mikol says it is filled with heresy and, and blasphemy, and one should not read it. So, uh, he definitely is not talking about uh, his, uh, his contemporaries, he doesn't think that they wrote the book, because he held them in high regard. He says that they were misled by some kind of a, of a charlatan who put together a book and uh, attributed it to, a, to an ancient authority, and, and this is what uh, they are now following. So, there's an interesting uh, development that we see here. <clears throat> if we recap what we have, and we spoke about the history of the Jewish world at the time, of course, very in very general terms, um, but we see that that in the Bible we find some um, uh, hints and allusions to mystical activity apart from the the the, the prophecy that comes directly from God, as it's described by the major prophets. We have certain glimpses like the vision of Ezekiel, the uh, the player, the musician that plays for Elijah, the um, uh, the, the Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah speaking about the fire that burns in him. And then later on, throughout uh, Mishnaic and, and, and Rabbinic period, mostly the emphasis is, the, the focus is on the personal uh, uh, mystical experience. But we start seeing because of midrashic literature and the and the uh, attempt to uplift people's spirit, the idea of of uh, of tying our actions to events in the upper world in a mythical way, then when we uh, we arrive into the you know post uh, Islam world, seventh century and on till the eleventh century. We see this divergence between the Sephardic world, which is more logical and analytical, and sort of rejects Kabbalah and then rejects this, this the mystical ideas and does not develop uh, a, a, a mystical literature, but rather a more philosophical literature. I would say just in, in parentheses that uh, it did uh, compensate for the lack of mystical literature by uh, dwelling very heavily on poetry and music, which flourished in an unbelievable way during the Golden Age in Spain, but uh, the what most works were mostly uh, philosophical. Later on, they were elevated to the by others uh, to to what they thought would be the the level of mystical works. But that's the Sephardic world. Where, meanwhile, in the Ashkenazi world, we see that a move towards uh, mystical teachings, uh, and we can say a major uh, part of it is. The influence of being in a in a in a in a hostile uh, Catholic environment, so they have to develop some kind of a theology that goes beyond uh, the walls of their physical or or mental ghetto. Uh, because when you think of being able to perform miracles by using divine names, and that your actions affect the divine world. It is very empowering. You don't feel as as uh, persecuted and uh, degraded you feel by the surrounding culture, as empowered you feel by now being able to save. Just one example: um, in his commentary to the Torah, she says, or she chooses to quote this midrash that <clears throat> Moshe killed the Egyptian taskmaster by using a some kind of a combination of God's name, right? Why does he say that? To tell you that to tell his to tell his listeners, and this is on the eve of the of the Crusades, to say even though you don't have a sword or a spear and you don't have an army, but you have this power, the power of Torah. Even if you don't see it directly, it somehow uh, you're able to overthrow the uh, the archangel of Esav that at that point is identified with Adom, Rome, and Christianity. So next session, we're going to start looking into the text of Sefer Abahir. Um, we're going to stop now the, uh, the discussion, but you know, we're open for question, uh, and we'll look into the text of the Bahir tomorrow. God willing.